I wanted to introduce you to our audience this is Doug okay. Brig- Brignol. And Doug Brignol is an expert on biomechanics and has a wonderful new book from the last five years called The Physics of Resistance Exercise. Doug, you were recommended to me actually by my audience, and I had heard your name before, but I never had the chance to listen to your interviews. I've heard quite a few of them, including the one from my friend Mark Bell's podcast, and they're really enlightening. I wanted to ask you some specifics about particular exercises, but before I do, I wanted to ask you some general, more general questions. The first one is the most general. I've always been curious, who designs resistance exercise equipment? Like, for example, the Nautilus equipment and stuff like that. Are they people like you who design them, or are they haphazardly des- designed by people that don't study biomechanics? I'm very curious. Good question. Um, first, let me just say that um, we should probably call my name Brigno Lee. Okay. Brignoli, just because that's the common pronunciation. You are correct. Technically, it's Brignol or Brignol, hmm. but um, it's I'm never known as that. So um, okay. if you, the more often you'll hear my name, 99% of the time you hear my name is Brignoli, and I'm just going with that. Sure. Um, you know, the, the fact is that the people that manufacture gym equipment manufacture it for the purpose of sales, mm-hmm. not for the purpose of correctness. And because of that reason, maybe they follow tradition in some way because people are used to a certain movement. It's easier for them to use that movement. Um, it's for a number of reasons. Um, the, the the primary reason being that um, there are certain things that are popular, yeah, uh, and certain things that are gratifying for the user, like using a lot of weight, mm-hmm. and it's also gratifying or fun for an an exercise to have an entirely novel direction of resistance, even if it isn't a proper one. Mm. So it's, again, it goes back to sales. In fact, I did a seminar one time at a, at a fitness convention. And uh, after my seminar, a gentleman came up to me who is the head of product design for a well-known, and I can't use the name, but a well-known manufacturing company. And he handed me his business card and I saw the name and he said it was the best seminar on biomechanics he'd ever heard. Mm. And I looked at the card and I said, oh, so you agree that overhead presses aren't a good exercise? Uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, I do agree. D- and- Doug, I have to mention there, it's the, the thing that struck out to me so much when I was listening to your interviews. In my entire life, I had never heard anyone say that humans are not designed to push upwards. But I had said this on my channel a couple of times, just thinking uh, we evolved from quadrup, uh, you know, we exactly. were walking. It doesn't make sense. We'd be pushing forward. We'd be pushing down. And I've said this before. And actually, my subscriber, some of them laughed at me, commented, you know, it's ridiculous what you're saying. Of course, we're meant to push upwards. The, you you have the same view. That, 100%. That- 100%. I mean, you're right. We, we evolved from quadrupeds. We eventually became primates, pushing progressively downward. Mm, Not even an incline angle is a natural movement. Yeah, I'm particularly curious about that incline press. I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. But before I do, some more general questions. So if a muscle, can a muscle be in general, can you design stress? So for example, the bicep is attached here and here. Can I design stress on a bicep curl or any kind of movement to stress this part as opposed to this part of the muscle? Or is the muscle unified? Ah, No, no, no. Well, look, first of all, muscles operate on an an all or nothing principle of muscle contraction. It's like a rope. Okay. So just like if there was a tug of war Mm. between two men Mm. and one man started winning and the rope started moving this way, the tension is even throughout. Mm. If it starts moving this way, it's still even throughout. It doesn't matter. You can, they can go this way. They can go this way. They can go whichever. It's always going to be. And the reason for that, of course, is because muscle contraction is designed for musculoskeletal movement, mm. right? And movement wouldn't occur unless the tension was even throughout. So, for example, if we're talking about, for example, the chest, and when people are trying to do these narrow chest flies to activate the inner chest, you're really saying you can either activate it fully by going full the full range of motion or you don't re- access the range of motion. What I'm saying is that the, the, the muscle fiber, when it contracts, it mm-hmm. contracts from origin to insertion. If you do something like this, mm-hmm. yes, you're working the final phase of the range of motion, but mm-hmm. you're not working a different part of the fiber. Fascinating. Why do you think it is that bodybuilders sometimes get the idea that, 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 that it's having a result, those narrow ranges of motion for certain areas of muscles? Well, very simply for emotional reasons, it's what they want to believe. Look, throughout the years, and I've been involved now in, in, in bodybuilding for about 42 years. So I started in 1975 at the age of 15. Oh, really? And, and, uh, and back in those days, you know, it was all 
well, it's still nonsense, but not as much nonsense as it was back in those days. Back in those days, they would make absolutely ridiculous claims. Like they could say that if you lie down on a flat bench and pushed at, a, at an angle that is theoretically toward the upper chest, that you're hitting your upper chest. Not never even mind it. That. Never mind that the resistance isn't opposing the direction of movement, right? So never mind that your lats are now tr- preventing your arms from flying backward, right? So there were some ridiculous claims, but it has always been wishful thinking for bodybuilders to think that they can carve, they can sculpt their body any way they want to do it. And the fact is that's largely untrue. So uh, just staying on this part about the history of it, I'm, I was talking to uh, Jerry Brainham, who I understand is a mutual friend. Uh, I like recently, him a lot. Yeah. I, I adore him. He's a wonderful person. Yeah. But I was recently asking him about trying to understand, because I, di- I didn't know that in the 70s, bodybuilders really trained their legs very well. They, I mean, a lot. They, they did the, the, the um, hamstring curls, they did leg extensions, and they squatted. I didn't really realize that because the leg size is so different than the modern bodybuilders. Just curious, do you have an opinion on why the leg size has changed so much in bodybuilding, the glutes and hamstring and quads in the last 30 years? Well, I, do you think it's exercise thing- related? The first thing I would say, well, a little bit, it's you know, maybe more drug related, but the, the first thing I would say, the first thing I would say is that um, squats is a terrible quadricep exercise. Yeah. Um, and, and if I may can just give you a little bit of physics here, you know, um, the, the most basic component of the physics related to resistance exercise is the fact that all of our limbs are levers. Hmm. So that means that classical mechanics, the rules that apply to to levers, completely, you know, applies to the human body. So if this was a pendulum hanging from a clock, right, it's going to be in the neutral position when it's vertical. Why vertical? Because gravity is also vertical, Mm -hmm. right? So if I move it that way, it wants to return to the neutral position. Mm -hmm. If I put it over the top, it's stable, Mm -hmm. just like a support beam in a building. But the farther away it gets from this line, Mm. the greater the moment arm, which is the term used in physics, Mm. the greater this distance, the heavier it gets. So that means it's heaviest when it's horizontal, if we're talking about free weight gravity. And just for simplification's sake, if it's halfway between vertical and horizontal, I call that a 50% active lever, Mm -hmm. 100% active, 50% active. Mm. 0% 0% active or neutral. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you're squatting, your lower leg is the lever that's being operated by the quadricep. It is neutral in the standing position, yeah. as is your upper leg, right? Yeah. Everything's neutral. Yeah. When you descend, your lower leg only goes forward about 30 degrees from the neutral position and hasn't even arrived at the 50% active position. And if it's, you're a power lifter, they'll tell you, don't let your knee go right. forward at all. So right. Don't activate and, your quad. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. They want you to use your glutes more. The more you push your hips back, the more you make that lower leg horizontal, I mean, the upper leg horizontal and the the lower leg vertical, right? So that means you're only getting about 30% of the quote unquote available resistance on your quadriceps. So sensing that your quadricep can handle more, you put more weight on the bar, which compresses your spine more. Yeah, that's also, I would love, I would really want to talk to you about that. And also. then of course, your your torso leans forward also. So that's also a lever. It is in fact a longer lever than your lower leg. So you're getting more magnification because it's a longer lever and it's tilting farther forward than your lower leg is, which is another reason why you're getting more magnification. Mm -hmm. So you're literally getting more lower back strain than you are quadricep stress during a barbell squat. And, and, and the reason for that is very simple. And that's because you're trying to use two joints that each prefer a different direction of resistance using only one direction of resistance. Yeah. So if you were to push your hips back and get your knees farther back, you load your glutes more, your quads less. Mm-hmm. If you push your hips forward and, and let your lower leg get in more into a, a sissy squat angle, you load the quads more and the glutes less, mm-hmm. right? So what benefits one more takes away from the other. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why you're only getting about half the benefit or half the percentage of load, I should say, on the glutes and on the quads and you have to use more weight in order to compensate for those reductions. You'd be better off just separating them and doing the glutes over here and the quads over there. And that's the reason, getting back to your question, that's the reason why quads weren't so big back then is because everyone was relying more on squats, less uh-huh. on leg extensions. And you think now they're, they're doing more isolated work now in general. Now they're doing more leg extensions and doing more sissy squats and things that actually use a bigger percentage of load on the quad. 
I'm, I'm going to, uh, well, I guess we should talk about it now because you mentioned a couple of things that I was very interested in. One of the things I've been mentioning on my channel as a former heavy lifter, and I don't do this kind of stuff anymore, is just trying to warn the audience about loading their spine with very heavy weights in an attempt to grow muscle. I was so uh, overjoyed to hear you mention similar uh, issues. Uh, you brought it up, you brought it up in the, in the, in the context of not being able to load the muscle fully and using multiple joints and using angles that are not great. But the other thing is this, there's a damage of tension of holding weight on the spine vertically over time. What do you make of, for example, what happened to Ronnie Coleman recently? I mean, we see a, a very heavy lifter. Right. Because I we, we've been people have been thinking you could damage your spine. We see powerlifters often get hip replacements, some other things. Sometimes they have herniated discs, but we never saw somebody really damage their spine like that. Do you think that was due to that kind of lifting? And do you warn people that are younger away from compound lifts unnecessarily? <laughs> Boy, this is a really big subject. Yeah. Um, and you're you're right on the money. But but here's the the the, the simplest synopsis of what we're saying here is that when you're powerlifting. Whether you know it or not, your objective is output. Mm. Your objective is not muscle load. You might think it is, but it's not. It's output, right? In other words, your objective subconsciously is to minimize the percentage of load that each participating muscle is getting so that your output can be more. It's like basically using a longer crowbar to raise up your car mm. because you, you want to lift a heavier and heavier car, mm. right? Well, the more load you use, the more you damage the skeleton, yeah. Right. The objective in bodybuilding should be getting the most amount of muscle load with the least amount of weight. Mm. And that's why understanding biomechanics is so critically important is because you can get, look, if you load a muscle with 90 pounds of resistance, mm. that muscle does not know whether the 90 pounds of resistance it's getting is 90% of the hundred pounds you're lifting mm. or 30% of the 300 pounds you're lifting mm. to the muscle. It's 90 pounds. It's the same. It's going to respond to the 90 pounds of resistance. Your skeleton is going to hate the 300 pounds or the 600 pounds or the 900 pounds because it can only tolerate so much. Well, let's right? make it clear to the audience because <clears throat> I think some people, because of the uh, honestly, I, I I blame a lot of this on, he's a wonderful guy, but Louis Simmons spread a lot of this information. He, he, he spread a lot of dogma about powerlifting. Like if you squat with the right form, it will not damage your, your skeleton. It That's will not, yeah, which is false. Right. He, he yeah. actually has evidence of that in his body. He has many surgeries, but people don't know about that. Yeah. Can, can, just to be clear, when we put weight on a, on a, on a joint, it squeezes the, the bones and the cartilage in the joint and tiny pieces of cartilage actually break off. For example, that's how arthritis begins. Immune system recognizes pieces of cartilage breaking off, sometimes considers a foreign antigen or something like that. Just to be clear, there is mechanical tension on joints that wears it, uh, wears them down, right? Well, there, there's, no, there's no doubt. Look, first of all, let me just say that if you look at a spine from the side, if you were to Google spine, you can see that it does this, right? So, the, you know, the head is here. It goes back like this. Then the lumbar spine goes like this and the tailbone goes back. Mm. Right. Basically, that's an accordion. You put a heavy weight on that and that accordion creates bigger curves. Mm. Right. The, this part goes out farther. This part goes in more. And, and, and so what's happening to those intervertebral discs is that they're pushing down on one side and they're opening up on the other side and you're squeezing out the intervertebral discs. And that's how you herniate a, a spine. Not to mention the compression right? So you're getting a number of variables that are happening also to the hips, also to the knees. And, you know, look, if you, if you squat with good form, you can maximize your output. And let me, let me also say that everyone has different length legs, different length torsos. So the physics is different from one person to the next. Some people can squat more comfortably. Some people can't squat comfortably at all. But again, the goal in resistance exercise should try to maximize, optimize the, the, the angles of your limbs relative to the direction of resistance mm. and squats or anything like squats, meaning a 45 degree leg press or anything like that is not the, the optimization of your limbs. That's why sissy squat, letting your lower leg get more horizontal is optimizing that limb. What, one uh, question I had, the, the only thing I, everything uh, that I've heard from you really uh, stri strikes a chord with me and makes sense. The one thing I was curious about is this. So if we're, if we're accessing the, the muscles, if we're isolating them and putting the maximal tension on them, we, I imagine, and I don't really fully understand this, even though I mostly study the brain, I imagine we impact our nervous system a little bit less. So I imagine that if somebody was doing isolated movements like you did for your uh, competition, which congratulations, by the way, for the audience, Doug won a natural competition at the age of 59. If right. I 
Natural yeah. Mystery but Universe. I didn't know you were natural. I was so impressed after I found that out, by the way. But uh, if somebody trained like you did, would they uh, maybe impact their nervous system less over a period of years so that their nervous system is less strong than, for example, the person who was overloading their body with very heavy weights? Could that make them less strong for the muscle itself eventually? Well, there there is a systemic stress hmm. that occurs with um, any exercise that has um, that creates an energy crisis. Okay, so a squat, a heavy, heavy squat done, let's say, to a point of exhaustion, mm. right? Which, you know, this, this, there's, as I said, this subject is so deep. You know, everyone thinks that training in beast mode is what we're supposed to do. Mm. And the harder you train, maybe perhaps to the point of vomiting, mm. is good. It's manly, right? It's because only the tough get tougher, right? It's like, it's not badge of honor, yeah. It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. The only thing the muscle knows it is the amount of resistance it experiences during the exercise. So when you're doing a compound movement, each of the participating muscles is having its own experience. It doesn't know or care how hard the exercise is to you. It doesn't know how hard the neighboring muscle is working. All it knows is how hard it's working, and it's going to respond only to the, to the amount of stress, amount of load it's getting and nothing else. So if, if the compound exercise is, let's say, loading you adequately, it could very well be overloading that muscle and underloading this muscle and creating systemic, systemic stress to the user. Mm. And I'm unaware of it, but systemic stress causes cortisol production. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then, of course, you have a recovery challenge, right? So when someone says, oh, yeah, but, but barbell squats increase testosterone production, and growth yeah. hormone production, I go, well, why do you think that happens? It happens because the body is perceiving an energy crisis and it's trying to offset the cortisol Absolutely. that you've just produced. Yeah. Now, so and by the way, you don't, you don't get a testosterone rise anytime you do a squat. You only get a testosterone rise when the squat is heavy and exhaustive enough to create cortisol. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's actually a second point. So the first point I was curious about was, does the nervous system not train as well over time if we isolate the muscles? The second question is actually, or the second thought I thought was, maybe the reason that bodybuilders like squats is because of that pro-inflammatory stress on the body that's so extreme. You know, the, when the body, it's basically the body feels taxed, attacked, and the immune system re releases pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then play a role, I think, in our natural production of growth factors in our body. So I wonder if that that plays a role in it. But mo moving past that, I have one more question before we begin in different body parts. Wait, let me just our, say that I, the reason why people like squats is because they can move a lot of weight. Oh, uh, you think so? It's not, and, it's and, not that. And, and it becomes an exhibition sport. I mean, if you're in the gym and you're, you've got a bar with weight and the weights are clanging, the bar is bending and everyone's looking around you and you finish your set and they pat you on the back, that's thumbs up. That's ego gratification. That's validation. And that is unfortunately a part of, 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 of bodybuilding, of weight training, actually, that, that, that is ever present, but shouldn't be. That shouldn't factor into the decisions we make as to which exercises we use. You know, what's funny is we've only talked about the squat, but I imagine you dislike the deadlift more and probably yeah. the, yeah. <laughs> so okay, okay, we'll get into that. But yeah. before we do, one final question about muscles. Is a longer muscle, like I've heard you talk about before the insertions of muscles and how some short muscles have a longer tendon. Are short muscles in general weaker than longer muscles? Like you've seen some bodybuilders that they flex their bicep and it just starts from here and ends there. And other people's like me, my bicep sort of ends here. In general, is a shorter uh, muscle weaker? With the same size? I would say no. I would mm. say no. I, I would say no. I mean, you know, certainly one thing that matters a lot is 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 arm length, limb length, yeah. right? So a person with a shorter stature, shorter limbs can move more weight than a person with longer limbs because of there's difference in magnification. But generally speaking, no. I mean, it's not. There's no such thing as a, as a person with a shorter muscle belly mm. having less strain than a person with longer muscle belly. That's not necessarily a consistent statement. Okay, great. Okay, so begin. So I wanted to take a tour of some of the questions I have to learn okay. from you because I'm a student here. I just want to learn from you. Well, we should tell the audience there's no way we're going to be able to touch on all of it. Of course, yes. Because just, it's a huge subject. But yeah. Just a brief tour. But one of the questions I had, I've always, um, when I see bodybuilders incline ben bench press with a barbell with their shoulders jutted out, trying to, I think what they're really doing is hitting their shoulders and a bit of their pecs, but they think it's hitting the top. To me, this movement is looks like the main reason a lot of bodybuilders have uh, shoulder replacements. 
just putting the jutting that if you see a bench presser like my friend scott mendelson whenever he bench presses he pins his shoulders back you can i think he's not receiving as much stress on the shoulder whereas a bodybuilder goes like this do you think my intuition is right that puts an undue amount of strain on the actual joint of the shoulder well i will say that the the, the, the having the shoulders down at least flat if not tucked back yeah. definitely stabilizes the shoulder right so as soon as you lift that shoulder off the bench now you have less support. I mean, now it's almost, it's almost like doing a preacher parbell curl without the bench underneath the upper arm, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's it's floating in space. But but the reason why I think people have shoulder problems with any kind of barbell bench press or incline press, uh, well, incline press has its other reasons. As we talked about, it's just not a natural direction yeah. of motion. But you know, when you when you look at a person doing a, a bench press, a barbell flat bench, bench press. Um, it, it might look like a similar exercise to a flat bench dumbbell press. Mm, yeah. But in fact, it's very different. And the reason for that is because if you're doing dumbbells, right, since your hands are not connected to a single instrument, right, this arm is free to be pulled toward the midline of the body by the packs. And by keeping the, uh, the forearms vertical, mm. it's just a neutral lever, basically going for a ride on the end of the humerus, as the humerus ends go up and down, the forearm is basically carried mm. for a little joy ride, right? Because you can't connect the weight right to the end of the humerus. Mm. You have to hold it by way of the secondary lever, which is the forearm. Mm. Um, and so that means that you're, with, let's say you're using a pair of 50-pound dumbbells, you're getting more pectoral load with a pair of 50-pound dumbbells this way than you would be doing a 150-pound barbell press because you're not pulling toward the center. You're actually linearly pushing to the outside because you can't pull in, yeah. right? So that's why when you're when, when bench pressing, if you put oil on the bar, your hands will actually slide out. That's why we use chalk sometimes, right? That's indication that you're extending the triceps using the elbows, right? So people can blow out a tricep sometimes doing a bench press. So the reason why uh, people hurt their shoulders with barbell presses is because they're trying to use as heavy a weight as they can. And when the arm goes down like this, this pectoral muscle right here is pulling from a mechanical disadvantage, mm. which means mm. here's a mechanical disadvantage. Let's just say this is the upper arm bone right here, mm. right? And this is the pectoral muscle mm. and it's connected right there to the humerus, mm. right? And so it's pulling from this angle. So when this bone is extended horizontally, it's heaviest, mm -hmm. but mechanical disadvantage pulling of the muscle in the bone is the, is the least productive. This is the more productive mechanical advantage. So that means that the muscle has to pull with five, six, seven times more force. And then when you let the bar go all the way down to your chest and the, and the, the forearm, the upper arm actually goes below the torso, it's actually having to pull from around the corner. Mm -hmm. So with so much force that it's actually pulling that humerus into the glenoid socket and grinding. Fascinating. The, the lining of that glenoid socket. And if, and that's why sometimes a shoulders come out of socket is because it literally pulls it forward yeah. because it's pulling from around the corner. And, you know, and actually, this, and this is all because they think it's going to cause more growth because, because this, the simple thinking is if I use more weight, I get more muscle load without understanding that physics plays a huge role in how much muscle load you're getting. You can actually get more muscle load with less weight using better mechanics. You know, it struck me when you described the movement of the bench press being like uh, this movement outwards with the tricep. That's exactly how Scott Mendelson tr taught me how to bench press. He said it, it's more of a like a lat thing, and they do a tricep outside. <laughs> if you look at if you look at bench presses, they don't have big pecs. The, yeah. the top bench presses they have big triceps and lats, but not. Um, but but before we leave the bench press, are people with longer arms more predisposed to joint issues with the bench press in general? Well, again, people with longer limbs have more magnification of the load and yeah. and and whether it's conscious or subconscious, um, the, the objective when you're trying to move more weight is to shorten the levers. That's why they pin their shoulders back and that's why they bring their elbows in. Right. If you do this, you're going to rely too much on your packs. You're going to tear your pack. Right. So they know if you do this and you keep it real close, you shorten the lever lengths. Right. You shorten the moment arms, I should say, actually. And then you're able to get more output. Look, if you're a, if you're a pole vaulter, if you're a shot putter, um, if you're an athlete that that worries about output, 
these same physics principles, these same biomechanical principles can be used, but used in a way that minimizes muscle load and maximizes output, mm -hmm. right? But when you're bodybuilding, it's completely foolish because you're, gonna, you're going to end up with some kind of joint damage over time. You're just going to do it. It's just inevitable. Doug, why is it that uh, for, for me, I, I, you know, I was never really bodybuilding, but I noticed something when I use the chest fly machine that has pads on it and I angle my arm inwards and hold the pad like this. Mm -hmm. I got the best chest development that I ever developed in my life, but it was a short lever. I've heard you saying that it's better if the arm is extended, but when I use those chest machines that are extended, I don't f notice as much development. Is, am I imagining this, do you think, or is well, the short level sometimes there, better? There's a number of factors here, so, and sometimes the shorter lever is better, but what's happening here is the pectoral muscle only pulls on the humerus, the upper arm bone. That's yeah. all it pulls on. So... When you're doing a pec deck that has, let's say, a pad right here, yeah. right? You're mostly pushing with the elbow. You're yeah. mostly pushing. This is sort of relaxed, yeah. right? You're not actually using this, and you shouldn't be, by the way, because if you do happen to pull your elbow away from that pad, and now you're pushing with the hand, what's going to happen is this thing is going to force your arm back, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to force you to fight that with internal rotator cuff, right? And you could, you could strain your subscapularis, which is your primary rotator cuff, um, which by the way, isn't as risky as straining the, the infraspinatus, which is the external rotator. But still, it's not, it's not good. You, what you want to do is you want to minimize internal and external shoulder rotation anytime you're using PEC. So if you're doing the PEC deck or anything that has a pad right here, you can go ahead and put the pad right there and just take your forearm and go straight. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and, 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 and just push with the upper arm bone and never mind what the forearm is doing. And, and yes, that will feel good because now you have less magnification of the load. You use more weight on the stack mm. to compensate for that. You end up with the same pectoral load, right? Less lever length, more weight mm. is similar to a longer lever with less weight. But, but a longer lever does end up sometimes becoming unwieldy. Mm. So let's just say that you were going to do a side, a dumbbell side raise, mm. and your arm was five feet long. Mm. Mm. And because it's five feet long, you can't use much weight, mm. right? Well, imagine the amount of flex that happens throughout that five ah. foot length, right? So that's why when it's shorter and you use like, for example, I've been doing lately a side raise using our multi-hip machine. Uh, by by re putting a seat high enough so I can put my shoulder right in front of the pivot of the shoulder of the hip extension machine. And then I put the roller just above my elbow and I can do that shorter lever length, uh, right? I don't get that, that unwieldy effect, right? And I get as much load as I want. So yes, there is an advantage to using shorter lever lengths sometimes provided that the weight you're, that you then have to use doesn't create its own damage. Yeah, so basically the way I understood it is that the ar that five-foot arm, ha it's not just the, the, the length, but also the point that there are joints across it. So there's, right. there's potential for the joints to bear the load a little bit. Right, I mean, if you're doing a, a, a heavy side raise, your elbow is trying to bend sideways, mm. right? Just by the way, like a side plank. When you do a side plank, there's an enormous amount of side pressure on that knee, trying yeah. to bend that knee sideways. And that's what kills me. It's like these fitness trainers that are supposed to be so knowledgeable that tell you don't let your knees go over your toes when you're doing a squat are the same ones who are telling you to do a side plank. <laughs> That's so so I, I, have a, I have an interesting question for you. I don't know if you've ever uh, followed arm wrestling at all. It's now a competitive sport. It's become a little quite bit, not, not a lot, but a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, since the days of that Stallone movie, it's uh, progressed <laughs> quite a bit. Something odd that we as arm wrestlers do is uh, a lot of us do these uh, short range of motion preacher curls with very heavy dumbbells. So for example, I used to do 120 pound dumbbell curls from here till here, but I couldn't extend all the way because it puts such force on the on the elbow and on this tendon here. And in arm wrestling, we don't really train to be opened up. We train for this inner strength. I'm just curious when somebody is, what do you think is happening? When somebody's sitting on a preacher curl, I use 120. The top arm wrestlers are using 100 kg. And they're doing these kind of jerky movements that stop here and then go up. Do you think that they're learning, they're using more bicep force or do you think they're developing some kind of like potentially scar tissue in the joint that keeps the dumbbell from extending fully? A lot of these guys I notice later don't get full extension of their arm. Their arm starts to stop here. Mm. What do you think of this kind of odd movement? Do you think it's well, accessing the muscle or what is it doing? Well, uh, you know, the first thing, and, and as you know, 
arm wrestling isn't just this, no. right? A lot of it is pulling. It's all pulling, yeah. Right? So you're seeing the feet bracing against the ground. You're seeing the body weight shifting back, yeah. you know? And then, of course, a lot of it is, you know, stop and start and faking and trying to make the guy think this and bracing for one That's thing. Right. So then, yeah. so I, I understand a little bit about it. And then you move in the wrist. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? So a lot of it is, is sort of like, well, it's hand-to-hand combat, right? You're trying to trick the guy yeah. into bracing for one thing, and then you pull another thing. Absolutely. So it is it, mostly, it is more bicep than subscapularis. This is subscapularis and this is bicep. So, yeah. yes. Now, in my book, I might even be able to find the picture of it. I don't know if I can do it quickly enough here, but in my book, I actually show a guy's bicep tearing during arm wrestling. Oh. And the reason I thought it was important to show that is because um, there's a thing that happens and it's, in, it's literally predictable. When you are, when your arm is extended, as I showed you there with that little wooden model, and when you're yeah. in mechanical disadvantage and your palm is facing up, yes, you, your bicep tendon is at huge risk because of the magnification increase that's occurring. Uh, that's you, okay. know, you know what, Doug? You. you know, Doug, what's funny? In particular, arm wrestlers sometimes uh, actually rip their bicep, not even with the arm they're using, but the arm that's holding the peg. Ah. We'll be holding it like that's that position, almost extended with the palm right. up. And the other one will sometimes tear, like it happened to Todd Hutchings in a couple yeah. of years ago. One of my um, chapters is mechanical advantage and disadvantage. And, and, I, and I show a picture of, of power lifters tearing their biceps, uh, arm wrestlers tearing their biceps, and a guy in a preacher curl tearing his bicep. Right. And what do these things all have in common? They all have too much of a horizontal angle to the forearm against resistance. And they all have uh, the palm is up, yeah. meaning that you're not getting any protection from the brachioradialis yeah. and you're in mechanical disadvantage, which is, you know, that angle like this where you're getting a significant more force requirement because it can't pull as effectively against that forearm as it would when the elbow's bent. So you can actually, so you, so you see, there's a reason for us not to fully extend when we're doing. Oh God, yeah. Okay, so that no, makes you, sense. They, 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 listen, if you put your arm in a tabletop with a hundred pound dumbbell, yeah, which would be, I guess, uh, yeah. a fifty kilo, right? Yeah, or so yeah. 55, yeah. 60. Yeah. and you let it go down slowly, and it's maybe even before you get to the bottom, your bicep tendon will probably tear. Yeah, I, I could that hundred. I used to do this every week, yeah. but if I let it go past there, I knew something would happen. Yeah, you know? yeah, and it's 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 very predictable. It's very predictable. I mean, by the way, I, somebody showed me a picture of a guy doing a, a in the gymnastics doing one of those planks where his palms were down, oh, yeah. and he had his hands like this, poop, and and it popped. Oh, wow. because it's all there. The forearm forearm is horizontal. The palm is facing forward. He's in mechanical disadvantage. Half his body weight on each side times the length of the forearm, yeah. by the way, which is, a, which is a 12 to 1 ratio. So you have 12 times magnification. So, Doug, maybe you can help me figure out this mystery. So in arm wrestling, we, we've noticed something. So there's a muscle here. I, no bodybuilder has ever developed it. It's something here. A lot of arm wrestlers, especially the ones that supinate and they hit with this hard supinating hit, develop a weird... Mus- muscular development here. Is there a separate muscle here? Because, for example, my trainer, Vazgan, I'll try to find a picture, put it here for the audience. He has a muscle clearly developed here, separate from the bicep mm. and tricep. Have you ever heard of this? Is that in I, anatomy? I, I'm, I'm not. I, I know the anatomy very, very <laughs> no, well. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, we have a, just a regular a regular forearm, but... No, but, before but it's here. It's, it's yeah, a very- I, 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 what I would say is that it's it's a muscle that everyone has that's developing in some weird way. Or maybe it's, it's you know, I, I can't, start, I can't address start. it. I'd, I'd have to look at... <laughs> look at the anatomy yes. and, and, and think of what it might be. But, but uh, I will say that, um, uh, and this is a philosophical thing. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process right now of writing an, an, an essay that's called um, uh, The Pursuit of Good. And, and the question of what is good and what we should pursue. In life or in, in uh, rest? In, in life, life, in sport. Okay. Uh, you know, in resistance, in, in, in men's sports. Let's so just say men's sports, which would be powerlifting, martial arts, you know, bodybuilding, arm wrestling, um, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, what's important to understand is that we all have, every one of us have a need to establish an identity. 
Mm. Right. We all from the time we're kids. Right. That's you can see it very clearly in kids are trying to, you know, copy their parents or copy something they saw on TV or, you know, they're trying to take an attitude and they're trying to, you know, be a hot skateboarder or they're trying to, you know, and more often than not, it's it's something that is perceived as cool. Right. So we, we want peer acceptance, peer approval. We want admiration from uh, from people. So what we do is we we end up falling into these sports that um, that feel like they're, quote, good. Mm. Right. But but in fact, they're fairly impractical. Mm. So, for example, what I said in a recent video is, you know, um, there are a lot of people whose goal it is to, let's say, do 100 pull ups. Mm. And, and they obsess over being able to do 100 pull-ups. In fact, 100 pull-ups is nowhere near the record for pull-ups. Hmm. Um, and so, in fact, if you ask someone who, who, oh, it's something like 2,500, oh, wow. it's, it's something it's ridiculous. Wow. But, if, but if you ask me the name of that, and I looked it up, and you could look it up, the name of the person who holds the record for pull-ups is still barely unknown. Yeah. Right. So your name would still be relatively unknown if you did 100 pull ups. I mean, on, on the world stage. Right. You might be famous in your high school or you might be yeah. right. But but if, but but what's the cost of mm. pursuing 100 pull ups? You know, now when you're younger, there's less of a cost because your body is more resilient. But when you're older, the cost is higher and higher and higher. So when we pursue arm wrestling, when we pursue powerlifting and we obsess over, let's say we've got to get to that 500 pound squat. I mean, it's. You know, and I've been I've been stuck at 450 for the last, you know, six months. And 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 every time I squat, I, I, I try to break it. I try to break. Well, every time I'm trying, you know, I'm getting more and more spinal compression, more and more hip strain, you know, and maybe you never get there. And maybe you do. I did an interview with Rick Drayson one time and he was all broken up. God rest his soul. And I see. Yes, exactly. And I loved Rick so much. But but I said, if you could if you had a switch right now that you could flip. And if you flipped it in that direction, your body would be perfectly intact. You'd have no joint damage at all. Your shoulders would be fine. Your back would be fine. But you'd have no memory of ever having bench press 400 pounds and overhead pressing 250 pounds. Would you do it? He said, of course I'd do it. Ah, of course. That's, uh, this is such a breath of fish, fresh air. You're talking <laughs> yeah. about something that I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about, which is uh, thinking carefully about your athletic pursuits, what they can give you and the, the cost that they can have. Exactly. We, we've got to be sensible, but, but it's hard to be sensible when you're young yeah, because, yeah. because we are full of bravado and especially in today's social media, it's all about likes. It's all about, I mean, I, I saw a video of a guy on YouTube doing, he must've had well over a thousand pounds on a leg press. And Those this was guy, really annoy me. The leg press and, and, and this was a guy, by the way, who was not a bodybuilder. He was not a very big muscular guy. And he was not even doing a full range of motion. And, you know, as he was, as he was extending, his left knee doubled back the other direction. Oh, my God. And, of course, he couldn't hold it with the right leg. So that came back. And thank God there were some stops oh on the God. thing and it hit the stops. But his left leg literally went farther and farther and farther the other way. You know, everything in that knee was ripped. The tendons, the ligaments, probably blood vessels, arteries. He probably had to have that lower leg amputated. Now, what's the what's the gain? He's not going to gain any muscle from doing a thousand pound leg ex- leg press, right? It was all about likes. It was all about impressing people, and at the end of the day, that is so not important. Right? So I mean, you you really need to pursue things as 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 wisely as possible because, as foolish as we are when we're young, we're going to eventually, hopefully, get old, and you will have regrets if you didn't if you weren't careful. I'm so glad you say this. We have a lot of young subscribers on this channel. I hope they heed your advice. I, I, just to put this into perspective, for myself, the reason I left arm wrestling, honestly, although I wasn't that great at it, but the reason why I stopped it was because I noticed visibly that the top arm wrestlers, even my coach, couldn't extend their arms fully. And I started thinking, hey, do I want to be a guy that uh, I already have slight knee problems from all that squatting? Do I want to be a guy that his arms also don't work? So that I'm 60 and my arms don't work, my knees don't work very well. Well, and, and, and you also could have ripped your bicep, which never might have been the same. And you could have also ripped out your, your rotator cuff. So there was all, all kinds of things besides not being able to fully extend your arm that, that could happen. 
But the, yeah, actually, it was mainly that they get extreme shoulder damage, extreme elbow damage, yeah. and then their arms don't even extend. So they end up being like Tyrannosaurus Rex yeah. with a small arm. Like Actually, there's a few. But the other side of it is this, though. As men, I think historically, we had battles and tribal warfare and bravado and some elements of our masculinity, I think, maybe isn't explored fully in modern society. So you're, I think 100%, sometimes, you're, you're 100% right. You're 100, maybe that's I, have de- I have a chapter. I have a chapter dedicated to that, where yeah. I talk about where did this come from. I mean, why do kids who are five years old like superheroes? Mm. Right. So what I explain is that you know from our early beginnings as as hominids, mm. we obviously had to protect the food we had, our area, our home, our 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 female, our wife, mm. um, you know, from invaders. You know, and you, throughout history, there's, you know, stories and stories of invaders that conquered this and conquered that. And now, you know, when we talk about, you know, getting food, we go to the grocery store. We don't go plow our field. Exactly. Right. When we when we you know, we, we drive our cars, we live in a civilized society. There's law enforcement such as it is. <laughs> and and so <laughs> we are relatively Hopefully. safe. Right. So so the idea that that we would need to be fit in order to survive isn't the same as it would have, as it was back, you know, ages ago. So, but you're right. I think the human brain is wired to the male brain is wired to believe that if we are not, you know, a, a specimen of masculinity, mm. if we are not feared, if we are not respected, yeah, that we are not of any of any great value. And so, it it it, it strikes me very interesting to see. The trends, you know, that we see men take, you know, when they have, you know, the skull and crossbones and they have the Viking shirts and they have the, you know, the piercings and the and and the whole like shaved head, you know, it's they're they're and the tattoos on the neck. They're literally emulating the Vikings and the prisoners and the people that were known for being tough. Yeah. But we're living a civilized world. But interestingly, that is an interesting subject. I feel like it is interesting. Even if we try to be so, just by the way, are you so you're interested, very interested in sociology? It seems extremely, extremely. Is your is your educational background in sociology? I, not formally, but I study it extensively. I mean, I, I my bathroom is filled with National Geographic and filled with you know uh, guns, germs, and steel. And I mean, oh, you I like uh, oh, awesome. listen, yeah. I love the subject of how culture has influenced. But you know, uh, there's, there's also an element sometimes I, I feel like even women in society have this primal attraction toward that. Uh, so not all women, not always, but they, some of them have that primal attraction to a formidable man. And well, actually, yeah, because, because otherwise they wouldn't survive. Exactly. And so right? they, they have need, that. Yeah. Well, they needed to find the stronger man yeah. that would bear the protection, that would get the food, that would be hired on the job. If you were wimpy, you weren't hired to help build the pyramids. Yeah, it's fast. I mean, you were dismissed. You were disregarded. You couldn't provide any food for your family. I mean, yes, you know, back that, and I include that in the chapter where I talk about how, you know, back in those days, in in order for us to get the female Mm. or females, Mm. you know, we had to, we had to be strong, right? But now, now the females are more attracted generally to the people that we have economic strength. That's true. That's true. But it's interesting also at the current time, there's also a lot of uh, speech actually in the public discourse about masculinity and masculinization of the man, especially in the West. And we see declining sperm count. We, we should probably talk about this. Another, I have to have you on again. <laughs> I realize I realize I've taken a lot of your time. I just want to ask a couple more questions. Yeah, on the, no problem on the at all. One of them is the, the dip exercise. I know you've talked about this before. The dip exercise, to, to access your pecs, you have to move to the side, right? And when people move to the side, they damage their shoulders often on this exercise. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, look, I mean- we, Is this no, a valuable exercise? No, not at all. There's no way that you can, you can make the dip more like a dumbbell bench press, yeah. right? Because, because the dipping bars are fixed, Yeah. right? You can't bring the dip bars out wider when you're down here and then closer when yeah. you're down here. That's you all the problems right? of a, of a, so, of a yeah, barbell. Right? So you can bring your elbows out, but your hands are still connected close. Okay, mm. So you can see what happened, what's happening to my forearm. My forearm is now not vertical, mm. right? That means that this is going to be, a, it's going to be too much tricep right here for me mm. 
given my body weight, right? So there's no way that I can, and, and I actually show a side-by-side comparison in my book of what it would look like if you could do that with cables. So you mm-hmm. would take the cables and you would go out and you would take the cables and you'd go down mm-hmm. and they're this wide here and they're this close here. Mm-hmm. And that's, that would make it a decent pack exercise, but you can't do that with the dip bars because they're too narrow when you're out here and they're too wide when you're down here. I have a question. So about and, and, and the pathway of the pec, right? If you the pectoral muscles are pulling toward their origin, which means that in order to get extension of the muscles, the insertion, which is the upper arm, has to move laterally out to the side mm. and then inward toward the midline of the body. Well, when you're doing dips, you're mostly doing this, right? Yeah. So the pectorals do get involved, but on a percentage basis, they only do maybe 15%, 20%. Of it's the work. A, it's it's a all front, front deltoid. Delta. Yeah, front delt, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's all front deltoid. When you do a, a chest flies with a cable machine, I'm curious about this. I right. don't know before, why before, I do this. Before we leave the dips, let me just tell you one thing, quick thing about the dips. So there are people that say it's an excellent tricep exercise. Getting back to this physics and that, that hammer that I just showed you. If you look at someone from the side and they're doing parallel bar dips, you'll notice that their forearm goes from vertical in the up position And when they go down, when they descend, it only tips from the neutral position about 11 degrees, 10 degrees. Okay. That means it's only about 11% active. It's nowhere near horizontal. It's nowhere near a 45 degree angle. It's literally. So that means you're getting about 11% of the quote available resistance. What's the available resistance? Let's say you weigh 180 pounds. Two arms is 90 pounds per side. 90 times the magnifier of the forearm, which is a 12 to one ratio, times 12, Mm. times the 11%, which is the degree of active, Mm. gives you about um, 119 pounds of load per triceps. Mm. And the cost is 180 pounds of body weight. Mm. But if you went to a flat bench and you picked up a pair of 20 pound dumbbells and you did this and you allowed that forearm to get fully horizontal, Mm. 20 pounds times 12 times 100% rather than 11% give you 240 pounds of load per triceps. Before, and the total energy cost is 40 pounds. Before we leave that, you, you, so you're saying that when, the, when this arm is horizontal, the tricep- No, when the, for, when the forearm is horizontal. When the forearm, but I wanted to ask you about the, this arm also. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood that, but I was going to ask you about the, the tricep extensions. I've heard bodybuilders say often that if you have your arm to your side and you do a tricep extension, it doesn't access the tricep as if you had your arm out. Is that true? That's, com- that's completely the opposite. Your tricep is more activated when your elbow is low. Really? So if my arm, my arm is parallel to my body, my upper arm is parallel to my body, and I'm pushing down, it would be accessed better than. Well, well let, let me be let me be clear about this. You, you, the the amount of uh, tricep load you get has essentially nothing to do with the position of your upper arm, and I'm everything glad, to do and sense. everything to do with the position of your forearm relative to the direction of resistance. However, however, because because your shoulder joint likes being along having your arm alongside your body yeah you can you can load your triceps More, yeah. most comfortably and and equally productively by doing a, tri- a type of tricep push down or a type of decline dumbbell tricep extension with your elbows relatively low and now you're going to get now you know if i asked you to flex your tricep you would flex your tricep with your arm low yeah <clears throat> you wouldn't flex it out here you oh. wouldn't flex it up here right because it flexes better when your arm is alongside your body. Yeah. That's telling you that having your arm down alongside your body gives that tricep the right length, the ideal length yeah. by which it can contract. I'm so, so glad you say this. And some people say, oh, no, but you've got to do overhead triceps to work the long head. Yeah. And, yeah I say, and I would say, well, it is true that you can stretch the long head more with your arm over your head, but that doesn't mean that the long head grows more because mm-hmm. it's stretched more. In fact, I've been doing nothing but either uh, a modified tricep, extent, uh, tricep pushdown, which is with the resistance coming from slightly behind me rather than slightly in front of me, mm. uh, or a decline dumbbell tricep extension. And my long head is as good as ever. Now, now so there's no compromise whatsoever. What the, the pronation or supination of the hand during that movement? I've well, that makes a difference. Of, that makes it. I've heard well, that. It makes a difference. The pronation uh, affects it uh, superiorly. No, it does not affect it in terms of which head is working. Uh, How does it affect it? It does not. I mean, the elbow, the tricep muscle, um, all three heads of the tricep muscle converge on one single tricep tendon Hmm. and cross 
the one single elbow joint that is a hinge. Yeah. So you can't. So there's no the way elbow. you can. Yeah. There's no way the hand position yeah, is going to influence the single tendon and the, and the hinge elbow. Right. So all three heads are going to contract no matter what. Yeah. But it is going to make a difference in terms of your elbow position. So when you when you're doing triceps or any exercise, it's always ideal to have perfect alignment. What does that mean? That means the direction of the resistance and the direction of your anatomical movement should be on the same plane, mm. right? So if you have your elbow hands slightly pronated, mm. it's easier to keep your elbows in. If you do this, your elbows go out. Mm. So if you're trying to do a, a barbell extension, resistance is, is going vertically, but your elbow wants to go that way, right? Yes, so, yes, exactly. So it's trying to make your arm rotate this way. So yeah. that's why you're better off using dumbbells instead of our barbell. And that's why you're better off using whatever wrist position, hand position mm. allows you to keep that alignment in the same, on the same plane as the resistance. That was incredibly lucid and uh, helpful explanation. Thank you, Doug. For me personally, I was, <laughs> I've okay. been a little bit <laughs> confused by that stuff. Well, well, maybe one, like a couple last things. Yeah, the, lat, the lat, the lat movement. I've heard you talk about it before. I, I've been doing something myself that I, I just sort of invent. I don't know why I did it. I used to do lat pull downs with a wide grip. I used to do the full stack for many years and I didn't have great development. And I, one day, you know, I was, uh, after I quit lifting, I, I was trying to feel the movement and I realized that if I put a single handle, and instead of sitting on the lat pull down, I, I put my knees on the on the ground and I could sort of lean and I felt more of a access of the lat. Can you explain to me how the lat, I don't even know how the lat moves, to be honest with you. And then I have another question, to be honest, no. a, a bigger question. I don't even know how the anatomy of the back is, to be honest. In bodybuilding, we hear about so many different muscles. How do they work? I, okay. I really All right. So let me answer the first one. Yeah. Your instincts are, are 100% correct. What you ended up doing, in fact was the exercise that I recommend most for the lats, which is a one arm cable lat pull in. Pull in, interesting. Meaning, and I call it a pull in because all the latissimus fibers originate on the lower two thirds of the spine and on the, on the middle part of the posterior, the upper part of the posterior of the, of the pelvis, mm. right? And then those fibers move diagonally out and up to the upper arm bone, to the humerus, so right? A- so, the rule is all muscles pull toward their origin. Hmm. That means that you need to pull toward the lower part of the spine. That's what, when I do the movement, I actually move up like this and then I move back. So it's sort of, it's always sort of pulling in actually. So, so here's the, here's the perfect, here's what you need to do for a lat. Number one is um, full extension of the lat is with your arm here, which is about a 30 degree angle up. Hmm. Any higher than that, and you end up impinging the shoulder. Interesting. So you don't need any more extension of the lat than this. That's number one. So when you start with this movement, you're facing this direction and the resistance coming from the side. As you pull, you turn your body toward the the, the pulley and lean into it. Away and out, toward and in. Away and out. Toward and in. And the reason for that is because if you kept your arm to the side, you would have too much external rotation of the arm. I guess that's what I was doing that naturally. I don't right? know. Really so you need to rotate it to not externally rotate the arm. Right. And by bringing the shoulder down, you get an extra emphasis of, of, the, of, of a latissimus contraction because part of the latissimus fibers cross and attach to the scapula. Mm, so there's okay. this kind of reverse right. shrug movement. Huh? And this is the reason why, well, it's a downward shrug. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like a like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so what ends up happening is that doing two arms at a time becomes impossible because you can't ro- rotate to each side at the same time. Mm. Right. You need to rotate toward this arm and then toward this arm. And you need to lean into it. And you can't lean in the, in the opposite direction at the same time. So, um that is the most natural movement that you could possibly do for the lats. Um, and, 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 and when you do that, you, you, you do get a feeling that you've never had. I mean, I've had people tell me that they've never felt their lats that way and their shoulders feel perfectly fine. Yeah, I never, I never really felt the last until I did that. And I didn't, I really, I thought I was doing something. Stu- I've been embarrassed to do it at the gym. I didn't, I never heard of anyone else doing it. Okay, so the other part of your question, which is a very good question, it says everyone talks about the back muscles, but almost no one knows what the back muscles are. Yeah, I really don't know. So in my book, what I explain is, and I, and I put back in quotation marks, 
Yeah. Right. Because I see everyone knows that the lats are part of the back. Yeah. And then if you ask them, well, what are the other parts of the back? They'll say, oh, rhomboids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, or the rhomboids or are the rhomboids the traps from the from everything else. Which well, the, the oftentimes say rhomboids even before they say traps. Yeah. OK, which is interesting. And, and most people think of traps as only these ones on top. They don't know that the traps go all the way down to almost your lower back. That's what I was suspicious about. I thought it, it looks like the trap is part of one huge muscle. And yes. it's not a trap. In, in fact, the middle trapezius fibers is the is the second biggest part of your back. Uh, right. In other words, you know, when when you when you think of traps, you think of upward shrugs, you think of this. But what you don't realize is that that muscle goes all the way back. The trapezius has more varying direction of fibers than any other muscle in the body. Oh. These fibers go up. These fibers go in. These fibers go down. That means it'll move your shoulder up. It'll move your shoulder back. It'll move your shoulder. There's no muscle in the body that has that much different direction of resistance. And yet it's only still called one muscle. And we, dif we differentiate, you know, middle fibers, lower fibers, et cetera. But um, the rhomboids are not a surface muscle. There's a, a, a deeper muscle you can't see. And anytime you do a regular shrug or any, anything, actually, they always assist. You can't isolate the rhomboids. So it's ridiculous to name the rhomboids because they don't, they can't be isolated. They can't even be seen. Fast. Right. So what I tell people is, listen, your back muscles are really only divided into two directions of motion. Hmm. pull in, down and in for the lats and backward shrug because the middle trapezius does not even connect to the arms. It oh. goes from the spine to the outer edge of the shoulder blade and its only job is to pull the shoulders back. So when people are doing a rowing exercise, they are not doing a good lat exercise and they're not doing a good middle trapezius exercise because they're not emphasizing the shrug. They're emphasizing the pulling with the arms. Well, guess what's pulling the arms? The rear deltoids. So basically any rowing movement that has two arms connected to a barbell, for example, like a T-bar row, how could you fully, if you're using a heavy weight, you, will, you won't fully, um, I don't know what that's called, but- you, you, you won't scapular retract. And if you do a one arm dumbbell row and you move more, you're more likely to access that, I assume. But you're still using a lot of your arm. Yes. But but here's the thing is um, there's a simple rule in physics. Sometimes it's called the line of force. In my in my book, I call it opposite position loading. Whatever muscle is positioned directly opposite the direction of the resistance will be the most loaded, whether you want it to be the most loaded or not. So when you watch someone doing a one arm dumbbell row, mm. let's say you're watching them from the, the angle of their head. Yeah. Okay. What you would see is that usually when they're in the down position, their shoulder is lower than their spine. Yeah. Right. But when they go like this, yeah. they're rotating their torso such that their shoulder is higher than the spine. That's well, if you're trying to get to the lats, there's no way. <laughs> what if you're trying to get to? So what's the best way to access the, 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 tr that long trap muscle? It's well, a, the, be the best, the best way to do it is to get a cable from over there. Yeah. And another cable from over there. Yeah. And then you hold the cables at about a 45 degree angle. And then with, the, and you move your elbows. Well, you move your elbows, but you don't let them go past your body. Oh, this is fascinating. I'm going right? to try this. this because, really because, because think about it from this perspective. Let's just say that you say, okay, well, I am getting some lats when I'm doing the scapular retraction because I am pulling with the arms some, yeah. but let's just say that I, this is the spine right here, right? Yeah. And let's just say that right here is a latissimus fiber. Yeah. And it's going out to that humerus over there. Yeah. And I'm going to pull yeah. on that humerus. Well, once it gets alongside me, if I'm still pulling, it's going to stop right alongside me. If it keeps going, there's no way it's me that's doing it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's fact, a re I, rear delta or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's the rear delta. In fact, I have to actually let go. I have to stop pulling in order to let that arm go by me because if I keep pulling, it's going to come back to the side again. That's right. So that's why when people do a T-bar row and when they do a one arm row, usually too, same thing. People don't even acknowledge, although once you call their attention to it, they go, oh, my God, you're it, they're feeling it all in the rear deltoid. Yeah, that's quite. They're feeling it all in the rear deltoid. But because it's supposed to be a back exercise, you know, they flex their lats and they and they do, by the way, I mean, it does involve those muscles. So, and we look at the bodybuilders that have done these exercises and they have impressive back development. So what I usually say is I'm not saying these exercises don't work. 
So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I mean, they'll look at someone like they're not, they're not efficient. They're not efficient. They're not getting. So what they end up having to do is you have to do a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. You have to spend a lot more time, a lot more effort in order to, to accumulate enough stimulation with the diminished percentages that they're getting in order to get adequate development. Doug, I've, I've enjoyed speaking to you. So I want to ask you one last question, but I would, okay. I would be so honored if you come on again, maybe I'd in love a few it. weeks, because I have, I have many more questions. I separated them by body part, but staying on the back, the last thing I want to ask you, I've heard you mentioned to actually Mark Bell about the deadlift accessing the lower back, which by the way, I don't understand. Is this lower back connected to the trap? I, I don't completely know if that's a, the same muscle, but I want to ask you, what do you think of those cable seated uh, uh, rows where people move their back and they flex it? Okay, well, he, he, here's the thing is that um, the lower back is not a muscle by itself. No the muscle that we refer to as the lower back is the erector spinae. And the erector spinae is two columns of muscle that start at the back of the pelvis and go all the way up. Well, some of them go all the way to the skull, to the base of the skull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so in fact, there's three small columns on either side. One thin one goes all the way to the top. Then there's a slightly wider one that, that branches out. Then there's a slightly wider one that branches out farther. So the, the, the one that branches out the most actually is even involved in torso rotation to a degree. But here's the thing is when people say I'm working my lower back, the first thing that has to be acknowledged is if you look at an anatomy chart and, and, and in order to see what I'm working in, how viable hmm. developing the lower back actually is, you would look and you'd say, well, what's all that white stuff down there from the, from the origin of the muscle, you know, before it becomes a red fiber? Well, that's connective tissue and connective tissue doesn't actually grow. So most of what is actually the lower back can't be made larger. Yeah, you can feel that even if you, if you, if you touch your lower back. Right. So, so then you see, oh, well, the, the actual red fibers don't start until about six inches or so above the back of the pelvis. And by that time, they're almost hiding behind the lats. Ah, uh, interesting. So you're not going to get much visible development by working the lower back, nor should we even think of it as a lower back. We should think of the erector spinae as the two columns of muscle that run up the entire length of the spine, and we should work them the way we work every muscle, which is dynamically with movement rather than isometrically. Mm. So when you see someone doing a deadlift, they're doing isometric tension. Yeah. Their erector spine is keeping their torso from folding forward, but the dynamic work is being done by the muscle that crosses the hip joint, which is the glutes yeah. and the adductors and the hamstrings. So, uh, you know, you're, you're better off doing less weight dynamically than more weight isometrically. Well, what is and, the dynamic movement for those muscles? Well, you would, you would run, you'd round your spine forward and then you would arch it back. Oh, yeah, I thought so. Okay, okay. I was just making sure. Okay. With a very light it, it, light. it is the opposite of the ab exercise. Yeah. Right. The abdominal muscles are spinal flexors. The erector spinae are spinal uh, extensors. Uh, so you extend the spine and then you round it and you extend it and you round it. Now, keep in mind that anytime you do this, um, you have, because we're dealing with the spine, there's a limit to the safe range of motion, uh, especially on the stretch part. Uh, right. So you can extend against resistance without worrying about going too far. Mm. But if you have some resistance pulling you forward, mm. there is some risk of folding too far forward. Mm. The same is true with the side bend. Mm. And the same is true with, you know, overarching your back with resistance. If you're doing an unsupported type of ab exercise where there's nothing behind yeah. you to stop you. Yeah, like if you're doing heavy uh, leg lifts with a dumbbell and you over overextend, it can be very uh, bad. For you. <laughs> the leg lift is a completely different exercise. I don't mean to go oh, okay. in a different direction, but let me no, just no, say. That's like about the ab thing, the ab side of it. Yeah, let me just say that the abs don't connect to the legs. And So, what, so when you're, what when you're the lifting the legs, the abs aren't doing it. Oh, so the abs are just moving that slight tilt in the pelvis. Well, well here's what's happening. The abdominal muscle goes from the pubic bone on the pelvis. Mm up to the front part of the rib cage. Hmm. It doesn't cross the hip joint. It doesn't connect to the femurs. It has nothing to do with movement of the femurs or flexion of the hip. Okay, okay. so then the question is, well, then why do I feel it in my abs? And here's hmm. the reason why. If I'm holding a gun right here hmm. and I pull the trigger and the blast goes forward, the hmm. gun goes back. Yeah. That's wow. a recoil. If I bring my legs forward, my tailbone wants to go back. Yeah, yeah. The abs keep it from happening. It's a, it's sort of supporting the movement. It's stabilizing the spine 
are trying to stabilize the spine, while another muscle, the hip flexor muscles, are, are actually bending the spine. But here's the problem, that if you look at the origin and the insertion of the abs and the hip flexors, yeah. what you see is that the psoas, which is the primary hip flexor, yeah. originates on the lumbar spine. Yeah. And that means when you load the psoas yeah. and it contracts, it pulls the lumbar spine forward, which causes you to arch your back. But mm. the abs are pulling on the pubic bone, which is trying to round yeah. your back. So you have two muscles that are fighting for a different preferred, a preferred um, spinal position. Mm. And neither one of them is working. So literally, you cannot fully shorten, fully contract your abdominal muscles as long as something is pulling your lumbar spine forward. Fascinating. So, so you are actually interfering with the full contraction of the abs by doing regular, and there is no lower ab. Oh, also, oh yeah, that's a very good. I wanted to ask you right? about. In other well, words, the, yeah, and I got to have to touch on this. So the first thing I'll say is the idea that you, that you would do a leg raise at all is not sensible. The idea that you would then add weight to your legs is even more senseless <laughs> because <laughs> it's not in the right direction. You're not challenging the function of the abs, which is spinal flexion. It would be like trying to work your bicep by, by, by doing this, right? By moving a different joint. I actually do 50 pound uh, dumbbell leg lifts and you, what you're sound, saying is sounds completely accurate according to my experience of what yeah. I feel when I do it. It's a very- so let, me, let, me just give you, let, me, let me just give you a, a very quick yeah. anatomy you thing on the abs. <laughs> so um, the abdominal muscle is one sheet of muscle that originates and it's important to understand that the origin is on the pubic bone of the pelvis. The insertion is on the rib cage, right? So why do we call this an origin and that an insertion? Is because we understand that insertions are more mobile and yeah. origins are more stable, right? So mm. this is the origin of the bicep. This is the insertion of the bicep. This moves toward that. So we would this, want to move from the for, from the right. From the so top. that meant that means that the anatomy was designed to have the rib cage move toward the pelvis, which is a crunch, right? Now, some people think that if you do a leg raise and you sort of involve the pelvis with it and you sort of bring your tailbone forward when you're doing that, that you will work the lower abs. Well, again, getting back to that tug of war with the rope, it doesn't matter which end is moving toward which end. Mm. Muscle contraction is going to produce the same kind of tension throughout the length of that muscle. So you're not going to get a lower ab. So when you say to someone, why do you want to work the lower abs? Mm -hmm. I mean, in a thoughtful way. In other words, you know, some people just say it rhetorically, mm -hmm. but in a thoughtful way, if you thought about why, what do you actually want to fix or change? Mm -hmm. They would say, well, I, I have a four pack and I want to get a six pack or an eight pack. Yeah. And I would say, so you're lean enough to see what you have, right? And they go, yes, I'm lean enough to see what I have and what I have is a four pack and I want a six pack. Okay. So the little dividers right there, the those are called tendinous intersections. Yeah. He wants to move the tendons around. Well, they're tendons. <laughs> no, I'm saying he wants to move them around because he, well, he wants, wants to, he, he, he wants, wants another add. one. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to add tendons. Yeah. And add a tendon. Exactly. And, and you can't do it. There's no way the number of tendinous intersection and the configuration of those tendinous intersections have been there since the time you were born. And they will be exactly like that until the day you die. With one caveat, actually, this would be a good point to end on is that, have you noticed recently that bodybuilders tendons on their abs have been disappearing? I don't know if you noticed recent competitors don't have the definition between the abs and more prominently, the linea alba has begun to spread. Yeah. And a lot of bodybuilders have an uh, almost three inch division between yeah, their abs. I don't, I don't know that I would see, I would call that a trend. Um, oh, I know it's that, been happening I, a long time ago? I know that Boyer Co. didn't have abs and that was in the 70s and 80s. Oh, really? I thought uh, it was Lee Haney was the first one. No, Lee Haney effect. was the first linea alba thing that separated. Um, no, I mean, some people have, you know, separation in the linea alba um, from the time they're born, and some people kind of create it later. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that is separate from the fact that we have a genetic, yeah, a genetic uh, just like if you have an Achilles tendon, you can't add a second Achilles tendon to each side, right? Yeah. So, so the idea that you're going to work the lower abs because you're going to add ridges, okay, that doesn't happen. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So why else? Well, because I have fat on my lower ridge. And also you think you can spot reduce. You think you can localize, lose body fat. And the reason why that can't happen is because when we use body fat as a fuel, uh, when there's a shortage of fuel coming in from food, mm -hmm. right? We don't, the muscle doesn't reach next door to the neighboring fat and pull it in because number one, there's no connector to that. But also because what's on the other side over there is, is adipose tissue. It's not fatty acids. Yeah. 
So in order for that to become a free fatty acid, it's got to receive a systemic signal. Yeah. And that's a stigma that signal goes everywhere. Yeah. So when you lose body fat, you lose it from everywhere. You don't lose it from the place. When you're doing a stationary bike, you're not losing only fat from your legs. Of course. Right. You're losing it from your face, but you're not pedaling with your face. Surprisingly, uh, this has not everybody knows this yet. Uh, it's crazy. It's would crazy. Thought, yeah, I was surprised. So, so, so what I say is, look, there's no, nothing, even if you could and you can't, but even if you could somehow emphasize the lower portion of the rectus abdominis, nothing would change. You wouldn't lose any fat there and you wouldn't add any ridges. So you wouldn't even know that you'd done it. One last question about this, yeah, just yeah. So to leave the audience with a practical tip. So you're saying that the top of the movement, I mean, the upper torso should be the one that's moving. Yes. Do you think that adding weights is unnecessary? No, I think oh. adding weights is a good idea because okay. I think the mistake that people make is they think that the more burn yeah, they, they get on the abs, the better. Well, no. I mean, the, the abdominal muscle is like a bicep. It's like any other muscle, right? It's going to respond to full range of motion and deliberate contraction. So there's nothing wrong. But the, my favorite exercise is a seated cable ab crunch. So I sit with a, a backrest and I have a cable behind me and I start with 30 reps. I add weight. I do 20 reps. I add weight. I do 15 reps. I add weight and I do 10 reps, 10 reps, 10 reps, 10 reps, 10 reps. Mm. And that's it for abs. Fast. And that's the best way to work your abs, just like any other muscle. You don't do 50 reps or 100 reps. It's ridiculous. You don't do 50 or 100 reps for your bicep. I've long thought so. Yeah. yeah. When I, You're when not going to spot reduce. Yeah, exactly. I'm so good. You're really a breath of fresh air, that guy. It's, so, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. You've taught me a lot in this conversation my and pleasure. also confirmed some of my suspicions, which is great. Doug, I hope to have you on again in a couple of weeks. I hope I mean, to be on again. I'll send you I'll send you a message. Thank you so much. Really. Thank you very much, Leo. You're great. You're a great host. Thank you, Doug. We'll see you. Speak All right, soon. Talk to you.